Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Maximilian Etchmeyer to you all. He, uh, Maximilian is currently a senior research scholar in the College of Business. His work is focused on the development of comprehensive theory of purposeful systems that is applicable to any domain. The work is based on his extensive experience in designing, analyzing, and operating complex systems in a wide variety of domains, including regulation concerning energy and the environment and mitigation of climate change. Other domains of his research include civil and military aviation, urban transportation, manufacturing, and voting systems. Max has led system design and process improvement ventures, advised business and public sector clients on policy and strategy development, and supported international technology transfer. Previous positions include professorships in engineering at the University of Pittsburgh in Massachusetts. He was also the chairman of the management board of the Joanneum Research in Graz, Austria, the vice president of system and control of Brickman Associates, and lastly, or early on, head of operations research of Deutsche Lufthansa AG. So without further ado, here is Max. So there are only a few uh, who would not be concerned about changes that appear to be happening to the climate all around the globe today. Uh, this symposium is directed at this issue from the points of view of science as well as society, a holistic approach that clearly cuts across all academic disciplines. My contribution directly addresses the holistic nature of the problem. It is based on the conclusion from much of my work that all interactions between the human and the environment are interdependent, or at least will become so as human activity reaches the boundary of Earth. Rather than about climate, therefore, I will talk about sustainability. Um, I will show that it is social and philosophical systems that translate knowledge about physical and biological systems into realities of sustainability. And I will use the example of a special, yeah, I have forgotten this is, yeah. Um, and I will use the example of a special form of environmental tax taxation to show, show that any system of sustainability requires a so solid ethical foundation. <clears throat> as the system in this slide, as the figure in this slide shows, the human system is only a small, inconsequential part of the universe. It interacts with the rest of Earth, which is part of, by extracting the substance of its life, and in doing so, changes Earth. We define the first as benefits and the latter as burdens. The system that relates benefits and burdens is defined by human-created artifacts. In addition to science and technology, these artifacts include the organization of society and the economy, as well as immaterial elements like philosophy or Weltanschauung and ethical norms and introspection. The objective is to provide for acceptable condition of, conditions of humans into an indefinite future. Um, the yes. the well-known report of the Brundtland Commission talks about needs of humanity that are to be satisfied for all times. It implies that the need of any time can be recognized by humanity at that time. It, issues, it uses the term sustainable development to signal its conviction that economic growth should be part of a sustainable future. Um, it points out that sustainability requires acceptable conditions for all humans, as well as closing wealth gaps between individuals and within societies and among nations. Uh, clearly, the work of the Brundtland Commission is just a statement of principle that could govern a sustainable world. But it led to the establishment of the biggest research organization in world history uh, to study aspects of climate change, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. It also led to regular meetings of world governments to prepare the political basis for moving forward towards a sustainable world. <clears throat> no, I'm too far.
Yeah, that's okay. Since the Brundtland Commission sustainability has been much discussed in the scientific, political, as well as popular li uh, literature, the focus of most of these discussions has been on threats from burdens on the physical and biological environment, in particular global warming. Often new technologies are being promoted that mitigate the emission of greenhouse gases but create other burdens on the environment. Um, while these burdens may initially be small indeed, they may over time increase to a level that alone or in conjunction with other burdens uh, poses its own threat to the survival of the human race. To properly account for this, all burdens must be considered at the same time. This would require a model of sustainability and the human system in the, termin um, in the terminology of uh, Wittgenstein that would be a set of logical propositions that represent the universe in a, its logical form. However, on the basis of strictly logical arguments of Wittgenstein, um, such a model cannot exist because it would have to be located outside of um, the boundaries of this universe, which of course is impossible. Uh, being part of the universe of human spheres, therefore humans cannot control it. Uh, the best they can do is expect, the, the best they can expect to do is identify the direction of change of the system and search for measures that may be able to steer it away from conditions that might threaten the human existence. <coughs> It is not a situation where direct quantitative solutions uh, such as obtained by optimization would be helpful. Rather, the most promising approach appears to be to develop a framework through which information about the state of the system can be collected, create artifacts to effect changes, and analyze the effect of the intervention. But additionally, it is necessary to recognize that the human sphere also includes non-material systems that take a li on a life of their own, such as the notion of the new sphere uh, that is proposed by Teilhard de Chardin. It is what can help us recognize important truths about the properties and behavior of the human sphere. However, access to the sphere cannot be gained by rational investigation, but depends on human introspection. And it is this introspection that Thomas Kuhn credits for the ultimate so as the ultimate source of scientific revolutions. Um, even though introspection does not have a place in modern science, we believe it might help us gain access to the deeper truth about sustainability. Now let's change gears a little bit and turn to a concrete example. About, a social and about social and political sustainability from the non-physical world. Uh, in 1918, the Austrian economist Josef Schumpeter uh, published a book under the title The Crisis of the Tax State. Um, it shows how the modern state evolved from the feudal state, which was funded and controlled by the sovereign, um, as a demand for funds exceeded the sovereign's capacity. Taxes on activities and conditions of the economy had to be introduced, but with that, uh, it was necessary to obtain the consent of those governed to agree on the details of the uh, taxes and the reasons of the taxes. Um, the sovereign could lo no longer um, claim ownership of the state. And this is what constitutes, in Schumpeter's th terminology, the tax state. Over time, the system of taxation evolved. The activities and conditions to be taxed became more numerous. The definition of taxes was ad adjusted to uh, take into account ever-increasing numbers of spe special conditions. This increased the complexity and reduced transparency of the tax code. Although taxation brought within, also taxation brought with it the negative effects that are listed on this slide here.
the result is not a clear coherent system of taxation with a clear purpose, but rather a more or less random accumulation of rules that, that are based on minute details of the economic process and often are in conflict with each other and require a resolution of conflict through the judicial process. This process tends to favor economically more powerful parties. In the end, the tax state is dominated by an ever-increasing burden of man maintaining itself and an accumulation of random rules that defy comprehension. Humans will lose control over the very system which they themselves have created. Schumpeter believes that the loss of control in this system is irreversible. And it will be the end of sustainability of the human system. <coughs> It is not the physical and biological reality that will bring us to the end, but the fact that we can no longer function as a, as a, as a society. Um, regaining control of the state and its economy, if it is possible at all, requires a radical change of the system. <coughs> Schumpeter envisions that the tax revenues could be replaced by revenue. I mean, just like it was uh, the, the sovereign who funded the, uh, the state in the feudal era, uh, that we could find a source of revenue to fund the state that is not dependent on taxation and therefore does not interfere with the uh, uh, operation of the state and uh, the functioning of society. <coughs> and he, Schumpeter thought he could replace the tax revenue uh, by revenues from the emerging trend towards uh, government-owned production facilities. Okay. Of course, what was meant as a constructive solution to a system in crisis emerged as a central issue of an ideological debate and a logical battle. The result was a polarization that set up disastrous battles for economic and political control of the world. The proponents of ending the tax state lost and the tax state has survived. The crisis of the tax state has continued to grow in intensity. It is fueled by new issues like globalization and tax and location competition. <clears throat> to bring about an end to the tax state, uh, it is necessary to find another source of funding for governing the state. And this source needs to be outside of the political tension of the state and not negatively impact the course of the state. I have proposed a form of environmental taxation that charges a fee for any imposition of an environmental burden. It its primary role is a control mechanism for environmental sustainability, but it would simultaneously address environmental as well as social and economic sustainability. I call this tax, uh, this, yes, this uh, system, the burden added tax, BAT. Uh, BAT is a control, yes, sorry, it has a, a, a different meaning too. Uh, um, BAT is a it, it actually, uh, the, the name derives from VAT, which is the value added tax that is uh, collected in many uh, countries outside of this one. Um, and it, it is, I, I chose that name because it is essentially very similar in terms of how it is collected uh, in, in, and how it interferes with the details of the uh, productive process. Um, so BAT is a control mechanism on the global environment that assures that human action will not result in an environmental condition that will threaten the survival of the human species. BAT assesses a defined rate of taxation on any type of burden imposed on the environment by any human action. The rate is determined by a transnational uh, global body and collected by the state. So this is an um, 
algorithm. I don't want to go into the details, but uh, uh, let me just um, uh, an algorithm to define or to calculate the tax rate of PAT. Um, this algorithm basically divides the state space of um, uh, the uh, human uh, sphere into three regions. The sustainable state, which is the region we want the system to be in. A buffer state within which the system can be controlled by increasing rates of burdens. And the critical state, in other words, we, we uh, increased attacks to move the, uh, the, the state away from, from the border uh, of this um, uh, whatever um, buffer state. And when the uh, state enters the critical state, uh, we are in, a, in an area where we know we can no longer control uh, our system and get it back to the buffer state with uh, the m methods that we have uh, prescribed, the burden added tax. We have to do other methods because we are really in, an, in a global emergency at that point. And if we exit this state, uh, of course, then we are in a failure state. And this is a state from which we cannot expect to recover. <clears throat> and I get back to the value added tax. PAT is as access assessed incrementally like the value added tax. In other words, every step of the production process, uh, at every step of the production process, you determine the amount of environmental burden that issues from that process. <clears throat> so, um, this provides um, a lot of insight to management of the uh, production process to make decisions that are really ultimately environmentally beneficial. But differs from other systems of environmental taxation because of its global reach, its universal coverage, and the structure that is uh, similar to the existing VAT. <coughs> Wait a minute, I'm on the wrong page. It takes a holistic approach that is driven by the science and data but uses the well-established economic law of supply and demand to achieve an allocation to the most efficient use, thus minimize, maximizing the benefit to humanity within the bounds of sustainability. As PAT addresses global sustainability, it requires global implementation to achieve its global objective. However, compensation for non-participation by some states is possible by transporter uh, taxes, uh, transporter levies or adjustments. So I'm um, here. Yeah. But there's a problem with this form of taxation because um, is any scheme that is based on the law of demand and supply, it cannot prevent benefits from, uh, from these burdens to be obtained by the most economically powerful party in the economy. Thus, it cannot eliminate economic disparities in the population. And in fact, it will over time magnify any existing disparities, even rather small ones. The phenomenon cannot be overcome by measures of, standard, of the standard toolbox of economics. Instead, to achieve a fair allocation of environmental burdens, ethical principles must be included in the system. <clears throat> this slide shows how far away the disparities between uh, countries already have gone. Uh, you can see at the top here uh, um, the uh, CO2 output per person. Um, and um, the United States is way ahead of anybody else except for countries that just have lots of oil. Um, and 
you see uh, over here the benefits that um, some countries, one country, the US, is deriving from actions that other countries undertake to protect the environment or to uh, stop uh, the um, uh, whatever CO2, CO2 uh, output and the uh, rise of whatever um, concentration of greenhouse gases. <coughs> A system of ethics is uh, to, to um, stop this, we need to introduce a system of ethics uh, that can modify our burden added tax. And a system of ethics suitable to rem remedy the shortcoming must meet all the conditions listed in these slides here. Um, it must, accept, must be accepted universally, which means it cannot be derived from a value system that is rejected by a subset of the population. It must be symmetrical, which means it has to apply to any country in the same situation in the same way. And it must be enforceable, which means it should not be possible for any country to ignore it with impunity. Here are possible um, ethical concepts uh, that could uh, satisfy uh, what, what we need. Um, we believe there are only two basic ethical norms that meet this criteria. The Kantian principle of uh, the um, um, categorical imperative and utilitarianism. The Kantian categorical imperative is the basis for the so-called rights theory of John Locke and uh, Thomas Jefferson, the US Declaration of Independence, and most importantly, the Uni United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Utilitarianism underlies most of modern economic teaching. However, already Kant pointed out that the notion of the invisible hand that is implied by it disqualifies it as a principle of moral action. Therefore, it is only the categorical imperative that we can expect to lead to an equitable allocation of environmental burdens. So derived from Kant's categorical imperative, this then is what we need to expect of a system that would add ethical principles to bad. It would allocate to every human the right to impose the same burdens on the environment. In order to preserve equal rights to all members of future generations, it would rule out inheritable rights to issue environmental burdens. It would assure to every human the right to live life according to their own values and to consume environmental resources according to their own values. And it will protect individuals from the negative consequences from overuse of environmental resources by others. And it would recognize sovereign states as legitimate representatives of their citizens and, to res and respect corresponding rights of those states. I call this system um, the Globally Equitable Burden Added Tax, GEPAT. Essentially, um, GEPAT allocates to each human the right to issue an equal rate of global burdens. It rewards them for underuse of uh, burdens and penalizes them for overuse. Uh, this is done by balancing the accounts for all uh, participants. Clearly, managing such a system of transfer payments at the level of each individual would be prohibitively complex. GEPAT therefore aggregates individuals by sovereign states and organizes the mechanism for transfer payments between them. This has the adv added advantage that it grants each state's maximal freedom to organize its affairs without negatively impacting other states. Because the other sovereign states will also subscribe to the categorical imperative, this should provide the basis for the evolution of a harmonious, pluralistic community of sovereign states, each governed in accordance with its own philosophical, religious, and other principles. It would eliminate the need for distinguishing between developing and developed countries. 
um, since the per capita allocation to developing countries would be the same as those for develop, to developed ones, they would no longer be dependent on the largesse of others to, for development aid. This would eliminate any aspect of coloni colonialism that is attached to the current system of, uh, uh, of economic aid for developing countries. Since the rights to issue environmental burdens are attached to each individual, GEPAD would also solve the problem of migration <coughs> that is increasingly stressing the political and economic order. Since all immigrants would carry this right with them, that is increasing that uh, their host country would be compensated for the burdens they impose. At the same time, since most migration originates in countries with a relatively small environmental footprint, GEPAD would eliminate the reason for much of the migration in the first place. Um, an exception would be highly educated migrants for which the country of origin might demand reimbursement for the cost of education it provided them. This table shows how the transfer payments under GEPAD are calculated for a sample of countries. Uh, only greenhouse gases are considered in this, sample, in this example. You can see that the transfer payments are quite significant. Um, the US here um, is, um, has, is in the negative $170 billion and uh, India is receiving payments of $177 billion in exchange for the underuse of, en of environmental burden allocations. <coughs> and if you adjust the burden added tax rate uh, that is shown at the bottom, um, you, this, uh, uh, the volume of these payments can be uh, increased substantially and uh, it can be adjusted to a level that can fund all the governments in this, in this world. This slide shows the global institutions that are needed to operate GEPAD. Most of these institutions could be developed from institutions that already exist. Clearly, repurposing these institutions would not happen without resistance. More, restriction, more resistance could be expected from the proponents of theories and practices that currently drive many aspects of the global economy. Many of these theories and practices are now increasingly being questioned largely from within. One example is the book by Settlercheck and Havel that is entitled Economics of Good and Evil, the quest for economic meaning from Gilgamesh to Wall Street. Another one is uh, a book by Grebner titled Dead the First 5,000 Years. And Josef Stiglitz just published an article that suggests the, that the way uh, value is determined in current economics, um, in economic theory, needs to be rethought completely. So, um, I mean, the, there's a movement that is recognizing that things have to change in the uh, amount, in the, in the way we understand our current economic practice. And there are new books coming out all the time. So, how are we doing? I have developed uh, this paradigm of what I call a purposeful system originally as an approach for designing, analyzing, and operating systems in any domain. In a purposeful system, to the extent feasible, this, the purpose in, is included in the, within the system boundary. Since the purpose can only be derived from human consciousness, every purposeful system has to include the human element. As a result, the system emerges as a process that, like a, giving, a living entity, by itself adjusts to a changing environment as it learns about needs and opportunities that arise from its own functionality. This picture on the left um, shows the iterative design process. The picture on the right 
shows the process of continuous learning and adaptation that continuously retraces the design process. This uh, paradigm of purposeful system is actually what guided the development of GE PAD. I'm suggesting that all of the human, human system can be represented by a large number of overlapping purposeful systems. Uh, the interaction between all purposeful systems define, many dimension, define a many dimensional network. It is easy to see that unless the interactions are symmetrical and reciprocal, an unstable, cancer-like chaos will emerge. The finiteness of the system will necessarily expose the tragedy of the commons. Free riders will defend their privilege and, if necessary, with force. Symmetrical and reciprocal relationships between all systems, of course, is precisely what defines the categorical imperative. To realize a system of systems where all interactions follow the categorical imperative will require walking back the narrative of our creation. It at least two issues need to be re-examined. The notion of an unlimited free will that make it, makes it possible to turn against the creator and the creation, and the right to control or unlimited right to control property. If this vision of a sustainable human system appears simplistic, we might be reminded of the mantra of Wittgenstein, simplex, Sigillum veri, uh, simplicity is the hallmark of truth. Or we might draw inspiration from certain indigenous cultures or from the writing of, uh, about individual responsibility in a society from Ortega y Gasset. Of course, it may already be too late. Free riders may already be too powerful. And on the basis of their power, they might claim the right to superiority. This would end uh, the human system as we know it. However, it would not end conscious life. There's no reason to believe that other creatures already existing do not also possess consciousness. They might be ready to develop their own creation nar narrative, take place of humanity, and start to dominate life on Earth. It is really up to us. All we need is insight, courage, and decisiveness. Thank you. So um, I like your idea of the different spheres, sort of like the, the original sphere and the sort of the we can still bounce back sphere, then the, the crisis zone, and then beyond that, it's sort of like, okay, well, that's. You know, nice try, good luck, next time. Um, do you, does your model sort of incorporate any ideas for like last ditch efforts to turn back from the edge of the crisis zone, which I don't know, I kind of feel like we're finding our, ourselves near? Um, y yes, uh, I, I think this is a very, very important question and a very, very good question because, um, yes, uh, I mean, we are talking about control in the uh, uh, Critical sum. Uh, and the, no, not this, the, the uh, whatever it's called. The buffer zone, yes? Yeah. Um, and within that buffer zone, uh, we need to worry about hitting the bad edge, the bad end of it. Yeah? Uh, and we need to try to get uh, the state of the system back into the uh, normal visible region where we don't have to do anything, we can just sail. Huh? Um, I think the instrument of the burden added tax that I'm talking about on the, the global the GE impact um, um, is only valid within the buffer zone by definition because um, I mean if it were valid outside then the buffer zone would include that part. Huh? It is something where economic tools and economic instruments can help keep the, uh, the uh, human system on course. Huh? Um, once it is outside of that, in the critical zone, um, I mean, all the alarm bells have to ring and we have to do emergency measures that may include the uh, 
um, the, the, the burden added tax and uh, the, the rate of that burden added tax to be uh, increased astronomically. But the problem, I mean, we, has, we have this problem already today. Uh, you know, if you look at the uh, concentration of CO2 in the, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere, we have reached a level of CO2 that will commit us to global warming for hundreds of years because uh, it will not dissipate by itself, dissipate by itself. Uh, um, and, and similarly with the, uh, sea, uh, the, the concentration of uh, uh, stuff in the, uh, I mean, uh, acids and, and, and whatever CO, uh, CO2 in, 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 the, in the ocean. I mean, uh, you know, we thought this is easy to dump the uh, uh, CO2 in the ocean, but uh, it goes and doesn't dump and, and stays there. So, um, you know, there's nothing much we can do if we have saturated the, uh, uh, the atmosphere beyond the limit. We can't say, uh, you know, <laughs> Tax I mean, this is like point. negative taxes in our economy right now. You, know, you can't go below zero in, 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 in this tax. Right. And you have to say, well, we have to shut down certain things. And actually, you know, this has happened, but not on the, on the global scale. Um, I mean, the, the pollution emergencies in Pittsburgh and in London uh, that were clearly, uh, I mean, they went on for, for oh, almost 100 years. And uh, people thought that was normal, really. And then um, when uh, lots of people died, they, they, they said, wait, wait a minute, this is not normal, we can't do this. Yeah? I know I lived in this And I uh, met people who, who told me that they went to, to work regularly. I mean, that was before I lived. <coughs> uh, they went to work with two shirts. They would change their shirt in the, in the, at noon in the lunch break because the color was black. Yeah. But they decided we have to do something, and they just did something really drastic. But it was not, uh, um, you know, an economic measure. It was you cannot do this. You have to stop this. I mean, this is the beginning of environmental regulation. Really, the nice thing about the burden added tax is it does not prescribe specific actions. So it is completely neutral. I mean, it is like a principles-based uh, um, tax, yeah? a principles-based uh, regulation. It leaves the subject of that regulation free to do the best they want to do, and they recognize to fulfill uh, the mandate. Yeah? You're not committed to specific actions. Yes? I was really interested in what you were talking about um, in terms of the, the free riders may be too powerful yes. um, to actually make this happen. And this is more, i just asking you to expand a little bit more on what you've, what you've already said, but in terms of winning hearts and minds, how do you get people to be Kantian? Like, how do you convince free riders that they should be Kantian, that they should obey the categorical imperative? You can't. You can't. I mean, you can't. Uh, you know, uh, I think if you have ever... Um, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, these people feel this is their privilege to be better than everybody else and to have more access and more rights to everybody else and everybody else. Well, you know, we're not interested in it. Uh, this is beyond, these people are beyond redemption. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Uh, uh, um, and this is not a political, uh, I, I don't want to get into politics, but uh, um, I mean, you see this phenomenon of the free rider everywhere. I'm a member of, uh, of was, and I'm still am a member of a uh, homeowners association. And uh, this is the ultimate, the microcosmos, the ultimate uh, uh, laboratory for uh, this tragedy of the commons, which of course is also defined in a small scale in the in the in, in the uh, whatever in India in the green area of, of the green space mm -hmm. of, of towns. Mm -hmm. huh? But uh, you know, if somebody goes in and says, "I want to take everything," he pays the same as everybody else, but he gets all the benefits, and everybody else just pays, and at the same at, at the. Um, national and global level, it's exactly the same. I mean, why should we 
as a country, um, I should not talk about that, but uh, uh, why should we uh, have the right to, pol to, to issue so much more CO2 and, and other greenhouse gases than any other country? And then, uh, it, yeah, but would you say that the GEVAT does? Because it is this kind of ethical principle laid over this tax principle, right? Yes, it, yes. It, is, it is an attempt to right. create an economic system that is Kantian in, in yes, some way. Yes, yes. Um, I guess my question then is, do you see it as ever being implemented, or is this? I mean, well, I, you know, dream. Uh, I'm, I'm Dare to dream. Into <laughs> dreaming, but uh, uh, the um, the two parts. Uh, in this, in my answer, and the first is, you know, the uh, um, climate change negotiations in the uh, within the framework of the United Nations. They really have demonstrated that people are serious about this. Um, and there's one country that says, you know, uh, whatever. I, mean, I don't know that I say this politely, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. We have uh, to deal with objective damn, reality. <laughs> damn the computers or whatever. The, uh, uh, more polite way is, but uh, we 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 take yeah, and, and, and we have the strongest uh, military force and everything else. But this is not um, it is not impossible to deal with this situation. And I mentioned this uh, with the uh, uh, border adjustment for non-compliance with the mandates of the of that burden added tax. Yeah? I mean, it is possible for the whole world to say, wait a minute, I'm dealing with the climate uh, costs this much money and adds this much money on our product. Uh, if you come in and want to sell your product that is not burdened by that kind of tax, we need to adjust for this when you import this. It's not a customs, it's not a, 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 it is a border adjustment. And th these border adjustments are actually common in many countries. <coughs> I mean, in Europe, I don't know what it is today, but yeah, even today, uh, when you export something, you get uh, uh, your burden added, your value added tax back, and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, it's uh, very co not complicated, but uh, very elaborate system. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I think most countries would be persuaded to participate in this. And it is not an onerous system. I mean, there's nothing bad about it. Uh, nobody needs to really give up something unless they are a free rider in the big style. Yes? And yes, I mean, the transporter adjustment is the only thing that I can think of. Yeah, and the other thing is just be careful to not get rolled over by, by some big machine. Right? <laughs>